Hello everyone, this is Exposé 247 where we turn the light on Christ, we are here again and we are on this series, the Prodigal Father series. So I hope you are, people are connecting with us from all over the world to continue this series we've started. And so Peter is here as usual to welcome you in case you are just joining us for the first time, in case you don't know what it's all about. Hi, um, everyone. Uh, thank you again for joining us on this um, new series of um, Exposé, where we've been actually um, exploring the Prodigal Father series. And um, thank you for being with us. And um, today we hope to make progress with this. Yes, we want to say like we are almost like two thirds of this story. We've seen the the younger brother, we've seen the, we are now the father. I think we are concluding in the concluding part of the father to exploit the father and to make us and all our audience know who the father is and to resolve every confusion, every every identity crisis that people yeah. might have about the father. If you remember last week, we were talking about which one is the father. Yeah. We see the whole testament uh, expression or reflection of what people make of the father. And we see the New Testament. So there is a bit of people not understanding which exactly is the father so we hope this week today especially we will continue from where we stop so we can really really turn this light we're turning the light today on the father just like we did last week so to know so that we can clear every doubt mm. about who the father really is yes mm. as you know that the identity of the father is very very important and important mm. questions that need to be answered all of the time we mm. cannot just gloss over it. You see, Very the disciples, important. like we said that they say, show us the Father. So we really need to know. Mm. The image of the Father must be clear. Mm. Just, so will you continue from that? Yeah, I mean, uh, last episode, if you were with us, we actually um, began to contrast um, which one is the Father. And we made some very important point that the very reason why some Christians are confused about the true nature of the Father, ironically, is because of the Bible, which is a very strange thing to say. How can the Bible become the reason why some Christians don't know who the Father is? And then we made some point and we said um, we've seen how God related with people right from the time of creation from Adam and right up to now. And it's very important that we as um, people know who the true nature of the Father is before we can actually um, enjoy the benefits of the cross. The Bible says can two walk together unless they what? They agree. But before we carry on with today's episode, I wanted to have you think about one thing. Uh, when Satan was going to attack humanity, when the enemy of our soul was going to um, come in um, right in the Garden of Eden, uh, you would notice that Satan did not... I, was, I began to you know, meditate and think about the kind of attack that Satan had on Adam and Eve, how the serpent deceived them. And you're wondering, if Satan was going to come down uh, what um, method or what way was he going to actually use to achieve a way of turning humanity against its maker? And Satan thought, I mean, through the whole serpent, he thought the most effective method to actually get men or women or humanity to lose out favor with God was to attack the way they viewed uh, God. That was, and if you think what we're doing on this episode is not that critical, have a think about it. The devil thinks it's important. Because what did he tell Adam and Eve? He, he actually tried to distort the nature of God. He told them, Satan said, uh, God knows that the day you eat of this fruit, uh, you will what? become like God, knowing between good and evil. So in essence, the devil was trying to say, you know what? Uh, you cannot actually trust him or in essence, it was trying to change how they viewed God. That God wasn't actually thinking the best of them. God actually has a plan not for them to have the best. So Satan think that was the most effective attack to change how Adam and Eve viewed God. And it's the same attack that the devil has up to today to change, to actually distort, to attack how we view who the Father really is. And the devil thinks the most effective attack on the souls of people. And, and that's the reason why we're exploring that on, 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 on Exposé. Now today we're going to carry on. And you see, last week we, we contrasted that um, the reason why the Jews and the Pharisees were really surprised at this parable of Jesus is one thing. They saw the Father. 
going all out looking for the sun. And it's a bit surprising. Why? Because they had a view of who the father is, the father says. And the view was, if you did something right, the father will actually favor you. And if you did something wrong, you will lose that favor with the father. So the parable of Jesus was a complete revolution. And there's one thing that comes to earth. Um, if you think about when Jesus was working um, on the planet for, the three and a half, for his three and a half years of ministry, there was a time they were going to preach somewhere and they didn't allow them to preach in that town. You remember the story? The son, the son of Banerjee, the son okay, of Thunder. Yeah, okay. They were going to preach in the town and people were not going to allow them to preach. And James and John actually told Jesus, let us call down fire on these people yeah. for trying to resist the spread of the gospel. And you know what Jesus said? Jesus said to them, James and John, he said, you don't know the kind of spirit you are made of. Now, here was Jesus showing up and confusing people, as, he, as it were, about who really is the God, who really is the Father, because they expected, I mean, they, these, these are men, you see the Jews and, and, and the people that actually uh, Jesus was part of when he was born, they actually had a view about what the Father should be and like. And then the, those souls, I think maybe they remember the, uh, the Elijah story when God yeah. was the consuming fire. God the consuming coming. fire, the, the God that doesn't mess about, the God who doesn't mess around, the God who actually, you know, he, he is good if you are good to him. And he, he's, he can actually show you his anger side if you actually mess they, about they with remember him. remember the plagues. They remember and, and all these things. And Jesus then comes on the scene and begins to represent to people how the father should be. And it seems a bit of a contrast to what people were used to. And that's why when James and John told Jesus, let's put on fire on these people. At least they, they are resisting the gospel. And Jesus said, you don't know the kind of spirit you are made of. And does it not apply to a lot of us today that do we really know the kind of spirit? Do we know the kind of the spirit of the father? Do we know what it is? Do we understand it? I mean, so many people don't understand what it is. And, 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 and Jesus said to them, you don't know the kind of spirit they are made of. I mean, for example, I'll give an example. There are some people who believe today that God is all... I mean, I, I see people saying this about the fact that if a nation actually offends God, that God is all out to destroy that nation. I see people say that. And I see Jesus saying in John chapter 3, he said, do not think I've come to condemn the world. That's what the Bible says. Jesus said, I did not come to condemn the world. That the word through me might be saved. So God did not send his son to condemn the world. And, and I think we have to really understand this contrast. And one thing that we said last time before we carry on today. Is we did say the reason why we have this strange view about God. Was the transition period of the law. Which was about 2,000 years. The whole of the dealings of God with humanity was broken into three. From Adam to Moses before the law. And from Moses to Jesus when the law was in effect. And from Jesus till now. Now what we did say is from Adam to Moses there was no law. And God wasn't counting the sin of men against them. Of course Romans chapter 5 did say to us that people were still dying because of the effect of sin. But, but it was not because God was counting the sin of men against them from Adam to Moses. The only time God began to count sin against men was from Moses up to Jesus. And the reason was obvious. It was because people didn't know they were as sinful as they were. So God wanted men to know how exceedingly sinful they were. And that's why God brought the law into effect. And the law was a contract for that period. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 again, that from Jesus, it said God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting the sin of men against them anymore. So right from the time of Jesus, we did say God decided to make his own son to become sin. So that means the anger of God against sin, the retribution of God against sin, God's righteous demand against sin. God put it all on Jesus. The book of Isaiah chapter 53 says, all of us like sheep have gone astray. They said God has laid upon him, that's Jesus, the iniquity of us all. It means whatever anger God has against sin. Whatever thing that God is offended with is sin, whatever thing that is in the mind of God to make sin to pay for, the Bible tells us that God has laid it upon Jesus. That he has laid upon him, the Lamb of God, the iniquity, the sin of us all, all upon Christ Jesus. Now the question then is this, if God has laid the iniquity of us all on Jesus, what is God laying against us? Nothing. And that's it. That is why in this story of the prodigal father, 
What happened is when the son was coming back home, the father was all out going for him. The father was all out waiting for him, waiting to welcome him. Why? It must have been that the result of the sin in his life, the father must have laid it upon something else. And it's not counting it against his son in this, in this series. So we see the father not counting whatever this son did. The father wasn't counting it against the son. Now, if you want to ask me, what, how, why is that happening? Because it must have been that the father was counting it against something else. We'll see as we go down in this series. Yes, if I want to, let me just lend my voice a hi. I found out that there is no way we can separate our personal experiences of how, what the quality of our lives from this revelation. So that's why we want our audience to reorientate our mind, to know the, to get the real view, to understand who the, real, the father is. We see during the whole testament, we see Job's experience, you know, you can't separate these things yeah. from the view of what the father is mm. and from what happens and what you accept mm. and the explanation you give to things. Yeah. The son does not want to come home, the yeah. younger son, because he felt mm. <laughs> he doesn't want it to be, he's not worthy to be called the son mm. because he doesn't know the father. Mm. He doesn't understand mm. who the father really, mm. though he's a son, mm. <laughs> but he's, he's thinking like a slave. Mm. Mm. And, 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 and I think, and I think that, that also is a, 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 another, I mean, a very important issue. You see, when the younger son in this Luke 15 story said, uh, I will go back to my father and I will tell him I'm not worthy to be called your son. Now, that statement is very critical. What he was trying to say is the reason I am still the son of my father is because I qualified. And now that I've done things that are wrong and I've wasted my father's inheritance, I think I don't qualify anymore. And that is how some people walk with the father. Hmm. We walk with the father and we think our identity, how the father sees us, is tied to our performance. And that's why he, he thought that because he has not performed well hmm. in wasting his father's inheritance, he thought it means he's not worthy. He's, to no, be, longer he's son. no longer qualified to be called a son. And that is not the true nature of God. That's not how God works with us. Under the new covenant in Christ Jesus, who we had to the Father, who we had to God, has nothing, nothing to do with our performance. It has everything to do with Jesus' performance. Jesus' performance is our acceptance and it's got nothing to do with our acceptance and, and, and with our performance, rather. And this is where the younger son actually had that mixed up in his head about the about about his father not that the father not that there was no retributive justice not that the mm. father was just overlooking mm. but it's just because somebody had to pay for it and in a contemporary legal world yeah. we know that you can nobody mm. a two person cannot be punished mm. for the same offense that, that, and and and, and that, that's 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 very important and I, I mean there's something you there's something you've actually said there and i think our viewers should take note of that you see we we you see we have to understand the deep and serious implication of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. I mean, I think even most, most of us know this in our minds, and we accept it in our faith, the functional effect of this in our daily living needs to be very prominent. Because you just said something about the fact that we know that Jesus, who knew no sin, was made sin for us. It means whatever is the consequence, whatever is the anger that God has against sin, God put it all on his son, Jesus Christ. And what happened is, whatever obedience, whatever goodness that Jesus got by his obedience, because Jesus actually, the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, that Jesus actually was obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. It means because of Jesus' obedience, if Hebrews 5 tells us that he actually lent obedience by the things he suffered, so Jesus was perfectly obedient, perfectly sinless. And the Bible tells us whatever benefit that should have brought to Jesus was transferred to us on the cross. And that's what the Bible tells us, that he that knew no sin was made sin for us so that we can become the righteousness of God in him. It was an exchange that took place. So it means if you look at yourself today, God sees you exactly the way he sees Jesus. Every benefit that Jesus' obedience got for him, God is giving it to you as a benefit. And that's the reason why when we come to the place of prayer, that's where it becomes an easy in the place of prayer. Because the, Jesus said that you, in, in those days you ask me nothing. Whatever you ask the Father in my what? In my name. What that simply means is if you come to the Father, you cannot come in your name. You cannot come in your performance. You have to come in his name, in the name of Christ, in the person of Christ, in the place of Christ. In fact, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 
He said, God beseech you in us. He said God was in Christ. He said God was beseeching. He said, he said God was working about a situation where we see our worthiness, our acceptance completely based on Jesus' acceptance and it's got nothing to do with us. To understand this dispensation, the difference in the dispensation and the importance of the death and resurrection of Jesus, even time and the, the way we read after mm. death, you know. Mm. So we know that so many things is tied to this resurrection and even the wordings of the covenants are so different from what is it in the Old Testament. You see, yeah. in the Old Testament, if you be willing, you have the words that if you be willing and exactly, obedient, exactly. you will eat. <laughs> if you're willing and obedient, you will, you will eat, eat the fruit of the land. Now, th that, that was God relating with people on the premise of the covenant that was enacted by the blood of bulls and goats. That's the law. That's the law of Moses. But you see, I mean, you see, even though we don't have that much time, and that's not really our focus on this series, we could contrast a lot of scriptures between the old and new. And if you look at it, you will wonder what sort, what, what, what the big contrast. There's one that comes to mind. You know, when Peter, uh, Second Peter, was talking about uh, the fact that you are a holy nation, you are, I mean, a royal priesthood, yes. called yes. forth out of darkness into light to show forth the praise of Him that called you out of darkness to light. Mm -hmm. And you wonder where did Peter get that scripture from? You can go all the way to the book of Exodus. In the book of Exodus, he did say that if you do this. If you do that, I think it's if you, 19. Yeah, yeah he said, if like you that. do this and you do that, I will make you, uh, I'll, I'll make you a holy nation. I will make you a royal priesthood. But God said, if you do this and if you do that, that's what he yeah, told him. That was right. It was actually put. I think our VR should check that you, out. You can check that out. I think Exodus 19. He said, if you, if, if you obey my commandments and you follow my statute, yes. I, I will make you to be a royal priesthood. I will make you to, I mean, to be a chosen nation. That's what God told Israel. But in Second Peter, when Peter would quote the same scripture okay. under the new covenant, Peter said to the Christians he was writing to, he said, you are a holy nation. He said, you are a royal priesthood. Call, I mean, and, and you wonder, why would the scripture say that? Why would you call us a holy nation when in the whole covenant, when the same words were spoken to the Jews and the Israelites, they were told there so would be a holy is, nation. Sorry, now, is, we can, uh, we can is, hear this. Exodus 19. I really want the people to be able to pick it to work in this world. That's why we are making reference to this. Okay. Exodus 19 verse 5. Now, let's, it's Exodus 19 verse 5. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed. If you obey my voice indeed. And keep my covenant. Okay. Then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. Okay. For all the head is mine. Verse 6. And you mm. shall be unto me a kingdom of priests mm. and an holy nations. Mm. These are the ones which that shall speak unto the children of Israel. Now, so that's so it, it, as, as we can see that, so it, that's very clear. It's simply saying, uh, if you obey my commandments and you follow my statutes and my laws, then you shall be a kingdom of priests. So it means, what does that mean? If you don't, if you don't take your time out to follow step by step laws. what I told you, forget it. You will not be a royal priesthood. You will not be a chosen nation. You will not be different. You will not be favored. You will not be special. You will not have something that is so unique to yourself just simply because you didn't do well in keeping every dot, every dot, every command, every statute. That is the deal that he had mm. under the old covenant. That this is how the father related with them through the covenant uh, that was enacted through the blood of bulls and goats. And this is how the Pharisees and the scribes expected Jesus to relate when he came. I know that's why when they were, they were surprised, he was accepting publicans and sinners in Luke 15. So why would you do that? And then see what the new covenant says. Now, let's listen so to in this. First Peter yeah. chapter 2, verse 9. So you see the wordings of now. Ye first are, Peter 2 9. Now, watch this. Now, it says, What? For ye are a chosen generation. You are a chosen generation. A royal priesthood. A royal priesthood. And holy nation. Now, it's exactly the same prophetic declaration. The one we had in Exodus 19 and uh, the one Peter. in first Peter 2 9. This is exactly the same declaration, but the difference, if you notice, was that in Exodus 19, it says, if you, if the you, if you, then, the, if you do this, that's the condition. If that's, if you do this, you will get this. That's Exodus 19. But 1 Peter 2, 9 says, you are a chosen generation. We didn't see any if, if, if in 1 Peter 2, 9. Where, where has the if gone? The if has gone on Christ. Yes, now, the, the, if, the condition has gone on Jesus. Jesus has carried the heath that was supposed to be in 1 Peter 2 9. It has been met in Christ Jesus. And that's the difference. And this is what Jesus was trying to show them through that parable of the prodigal father in the Luke 15 parable. Why the father was able to accept the son without we seeing the father reacting to the son, but the father was acting instead of reacting. 
And this is quite uh, the thing that is coming out in this Luke 15 parable. Uh, to round up today, I was just going to say it's going to be a great tra tragedy for somebody in this dispensation because it's already signed and sealed. We can't, you can't go back and undo mm. the death and the resurrection of Jesus again. It's already mm. signed. We're in the new era now. His, mm. his death has been finalized. It's signed and sealed. Mm. And living as if he's in the Old Testament, living mm. in the wordings, in fact, in fact, the, the, the old contrast, just like somebody <laughs> that is a, 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 you know, the phones and the iPhones and everything, you're not that, uh, no. the, to upgrade to the next level, which is free, you, you, you know, just update. And somebody's <laughs> living on the old, <laughs> mm. which is dead. The software is free, just, and it's living on the words. He's still doing, and he's putting himself, carrying the body of, I must obey. I must do this. I mm. must do this myself. I must fulfill all the condition myself instead of instead of accepting. You know, you know, you know. This, in Hebrews chapter one, it said God, had, I mean, in diverse manners, and at different times, and at different times, has spoken to us through the prophet. God has spoken. I mean, He spoke to the prophet, but He said, in these last days, God has spoken, and they do speak Him through His Son, mm. the Son of God, Jesus, is the ultimate revelation of the Father. It means whatever revelation people had of God through the prophets, they were great, they were good. But the ultimate revelation through his son supersedes oh, wow. any prayer revelation of God through the prophets. And you see, uh, we would do well uh, in actually dipping ourselves into the revelation of the Father that Christ brings. And that's why Christ told them, if you sin me, you, you sin, sin the, Father. the Father. I am the ultimate of what the Father stands for. The Bible says in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. And, and, and that's what we're looking at. So Jesus, in this Luke 15 parable, he represented to them who the Father is. And I know the, the scribes and the Pharisees were surprised at this picture of the Father. And, and that's what we, we, we are trying to actually present here. Yeah. So we expect you to do the recalibration and just know to the new time to tell you that mm. they upgrade. And so you don't cheat yourself. Mm. You don't necessarily carry the bodies mm. uh, fulfilling the condition that is already done. It's already Christ there. Christ is the condition met. He is the condition that has been met. So as you go out this week, you begin to look at the Father in this new light. Mm. And see He's loving. Yeah, you can see that all the condition has been satisfied mm. in Christ. Amen. And so to see you next week, please stay tuned and stay understanding the prodigal Father. Amen. God bless you. Okay, bye. bye.